Thank you, Joshua and Sergo. Yeah, and may the Lord continue to bless our young people. I enjoyed having our collegiates up here so much for the song service. And uh, thank you for sharing your gifts and making it a priority. Let's pray. Father, we've gathered here in your house to honor you, to be taught of you, and to go away changed by your presence, the encounter that we've prayed for. So now, Lord, forgive our sins and hear us, and may this truly be a divine encounter with you as your word is opened. May your spirit fill us, impress us, and teach us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning, I want to ask you to think about how important it is for a human relationship to have accountability. Uh, physicists have created these laws of thermodynamics, one of which is that everything moves from a state of order to disorder. It's kind of like when you have a car and you hit this great big pothole and you don't want to tell your husband or your wife that you did it, but whenever they drive down the road and they let go of the wheel for just a few minutes, the car wants to go like this. Until that's addressed, you've got a problem. And the problem is, is that the car's out of alignment. And what happens in human relationships when there's not accountability is that things get out of alignment. It happens sometimes with our marriage partners. It happens sometimes with adolescent or adult children. It can happen with your boss. It can happen with your preacher or teacher. But a relationship that's not properly aligned is dangerous for everyone in the car. Because there are some moments, I mean, it's not so much nowadays because most of our cars are front-wheel drive, but years ago, most of them were real-wheel drive. And it wasn't anything to be behind a car and the back of the car was over six or eight inches to the direction opposite of the front wheels. And you could just say, oh, that car's got a problem. Uh, I was thinking between the services about uh, this concept and I realized how important school is I, and field trips. When I was a boy, probably in the sixth grade, we, I grew up in Peoria, Illinois, and they took us on a field trip to Springfield. And I can remember walking through one of the hallways and the tour guide stopped us and they told us that in the days of Abraham Lincoln, who was a lawyer, that if you witnessed a crime through a glass window, it was not admissible as a testimony witness in court. The glass was of such a nature that it bent the visuals and it was hard to distinctly see through the glass. Now, this morning I want to talk to you about narratives. The word narrative used to mean just a story. But in a postmodern age, narrative now means a collection of facts to say what you want to say. Without objective truth and without a belief that you can ever get to objective truth, all you have is, all you have is perspective. Now, while we know perspective is a part of an individual experience because we have four renditions of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we see is that, and what you can buy is what's called a harmony of the gospels. In other words, the main body of truth is not destroyed by the different witnesses. It is only highlighted. And what you have is a much fuller, richer understanding of truth because you're hearing it from four different people. But the core dynamic, the core effect, the core experience remains the same. Now, I want everybody to know that when you hear somebody say, that's your narrative, that's your narrative. There's only one way to get to the place where it's no longer about how I think I see it or you think you see it. There's only one thing to do. And when a person won't do that or an institution won't do that, it's because they actually do have a narrative and they actually aren't desirous that we could see beyond a glass darkly or dimly, but we could see transparently into the whole body of truth. Because truth Jesus said, sets people free. I'll say that again. Truth sets people free. I'm going to say it one more time. Truth sets people free. Thank you. Because you're living in a society who no longer believes there is anything but truth, only perspective. And when you have that situation, two things have, you have two options. The first option is you can have an investigation. Now, whenever there's a court trial, you have this kind of phenomena. 
And uh, my wife, having recently sat in as a juror on a federal court case, she had to listen. She couldn't share. So I had to wait till it was all done to hear the details of the experience. But I want to tell you, in a court of law, you have people who sometimes don't have ethics. They're not people of integrity. And they're trying to get you to believe their version of the story because sinful people who don't have a commitment to Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life are willing to massage information to make something appear a certain way. And I don't want you to think that this is anything new. In the heavenly courts, Lucifer had a narrative, did he not? He didn't know all the truth, but he knew enough truth to know he wasn't telling it all. And then we come down to the Garden of Eden. The serpent has a narrative, doesn't he? Maybe it was a she, I don't know. But the, the, the serpent is hanging in the branches of the tree and he is bringing together certain bits of information. You could say that probably nothing, few things that he said with the exception of thou shall not surely die are probably flat out wrong. But he has a narrative. And unless we think that it's only bad people that have narratives, remember that Abraham two times had a certain narrative about Mrs. Abraham, and the narrative was, she's my sister. So I don't want you to think that people are automatically given to a wrong collection of facts, or that's only for bad people. Even good people sometimes will leave a few things out because they think it'll work out better. But I want to tell you, people have a very bad record of being prophets. And when it comes to issues of principle and morality, you must let the, the journey of full transparency take its course or else you end up needing divine intervention. And by the time there's divine intervention on behalf of the oppressed, it's almost always bad news for the oppressors. Now, we are Seventh-day Adventists and we preach uh, from Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, fear God and give glory to Him for the what has come? The hour of judgment. Now, if there was ever a church that was a church that believed in accountability, it is this church. Every Protestant church for the last 500 years has believed that in the end, the adherents, and, and even many of the Catholic faith have believed in adherents, that somehow, someday, people are going to have to stand before God. Jesus said we're going to have to face everything we've said and everything we've done. Now, the good news is God himself believes in accountability to such a fact that he would take the accountability of man as a sinner, woman as a sinner, and he would pay the price for sin, which was not just dying, it was dying the second death, a sense of complete separation from God. So since we have a judgment hour message, no body of believers can be more committed to the idea of investigation than those who have taught for over 100 years the investigative judgment. Which means that when it comes to following Matthew 18, which says if your brother has ought against you, go and tell him. If that doesn't work out, take somebody else because maybe you're not seeing it right. But eventually, if you're seeing it right and he won't listen to the two of you, then you tell it to the whole church. Messy, messy, messy. But I'm here to tell you, we believe, as I mentioned not too many Sabbaths ago, that there is this pyramid of authority and loyalty, and it starts with God. And God believes that the best way for us to get it right is to let a body of believers look at it. So I want to assure you today, you're living in an age in which with no absolute truth, what you say is just a perspective. It's not truth. But I'm here to tell you today, the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let it be established because it is the closest thing that you're going to get when you involve humans. Truth does exist. It is discoverable. It is God's intention to make it known. Accountability is a function of making sure that humanity, which is out of alignment with its own moral creation, is brought back into alignment with the path of happiness and hope. When a relationship loses, whether it's with your boss or your employer, an institution in the church, your spouse, or your children, when it refuses to accept the alignment of moral principle and precept on the relationship, then there is abuse of power.
There is a problem. You can't solve a problem with dishonest parties because when parties are dishonest, they will create narratives. And the only way to see who's telling the truth is to see which person is more willing for more of the truth to be seen. And I want you to think about this. When you say to your husband, I feel uncomfortable about you coming late from the office night by night. Do you mind if I have a look at your text messages? Do you mind if I look at your emails? Do you mind if I call your boss? Well, the relationship's pretty wounded by then already, but I can assure you for the person to say, if you do that, I'll divorce you. It's like perfect proof. But when there's no guilt, or when there's a willingness to admit guilt, then there's a willingness to show the whole story. So having said that, I want to remind you that in the book of Malachi chapter 4, it says before Jesus comes, the great and terrible day of the Lord, that Elijah is going to come. And Elijah is the ultimate voice of accountability. He's the last voice of accountability to a dying, darkening world. And that message is going to be what John the Baptist's message was. And Jesus said, if you can accept it, he's Elijah. But of course, that wasn't the great and terrible day of the Lord. That was just the first advent. So this last Elijah is going to be a messenger to confront the pride of the world and call them to repentance in hopes that they won't lose life eternal and inheritance that's already paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're living in some pretty serious sober times. And I'm thankful for the accountability I've had in my life where my mother made me face myself. But facing yourself can be a little bit embarrassing. It can be a tad bit awkward and humiliating, especially if you become kind of full of yourself in an effort to convince yourself you're not exactly what you are. We call that pride. And the more less sure you are of yourself in your created version, the more proud you'll be in your self-created version. And when that happens, everything gets touchy. So I'd like for you to take your uh, bulletins and I want to read this quote in it with you together. It'd be a good one to put up on your refrigerator because I'm going to let Ellen White show you how this works. This morning we're going to be talking about Elijah and Ahab. It's a modern day story that just needs to be looked at again. God had sent messengers to Israel, so that means before Elijah showed up there were others, with appeals to return to their allegiance. That allegiance was to God. Had they heeded these appeals, had they turned from Baal to the living God, Elijah's message of judgment would never have been given. But the warnings that might have been a savor of life unto life proved to them a savor of death unto death. How does that work? Well, I just want you to know, if you need to know how it works, think about Pharaoh and Moses. What could have been a moment to turn and repent and save the nation turned into a hardening of head and heart against the divinity of God speaking through the messenger Moses. That's how it goes from being a savor of life unto life. Now, here is the phrase that I've highlighted that's important, I think, for you to understand how it works. Their pride, and we'll start with Ahab, but it's his whole, um, it's his whole cabinet. It's all in government and in the church. Their pride had been wounded. Now, there's probably nothing more dangerous than a person whose pride has been wounded. And let all the Christians listening to me here this morning be very aware that God made us in his image and dignity and respect are what we're to show to each other. So when you're in a committee meeting and you make a slash and dash comment about somebody else's comment, you might just be on the road to imploding the whole meeting because you wounded somebody's pride and you didn't need to. I want you to stop and think about this. The person who succeeds best in leadership and administration is the one who can get where he's got to go, protecting the dignity of the one who might be wrong. Now, mind you, that can all be blown up. If somebody won't listen to the behind-the-scenes discourse and the one-on-one -on -one dialogue, then it might have to end up in front of the whole church, and the, the house might have to be burnt down. And that would be a terrible thing. But what I want you to know is that when a person's pride is wounded and they don't repent, this is what follows. Their anger had been aroused against the messengers. Now, how terrible can words be? Except that words create realities, especially in family or social settings. And people that hold positional power could find themselves without the same 
trust and respect from those they are to hold it for and hold it by their consent, at least in modern history. And so wounded pride leads to aroused anger, and now they regard with intense, regarded with intense hatred the prophet Elijah. So let's just follow the play. Prophet shows up. It's not going to rain. You're bowing down to the Baals and you're breaking your covenant with God. Who is he to tell us what we're doing is wrong? It sounds like a 21st century um, narrative. The anger of the nation is aroused against him and pretty soon Ahab will send ambassadors to all the countries around Israel making them swear under oath that they are not harboring criminal Elijah. Now, if you think anything has changed, then you just need to go back and think about the story of Cain and Abel. All that has to happen is somebody has to get on a wrong path and they don't want to hear about it. And should you be the misfortunate one to speak up and say, you know what, what you're doing is wrong, you get to bear the wrath of the wrongdoer. Now, while Abel's blood cried out and God heard it and confronted Cain, and Cain bore a mark. Most of all, Cain lost out on eternal life, it appears. The truth of the matter is, the accountability, since men love darkness rather than light, this is the testimony of John chapter 3. John records the story of Jesus with Nicodemus. In John 3, verse 3, after he's just been paid a, a compliment, Jesus says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 1 will tell us that these people had once known God and they even knew his ordinances, but their dark, the darkness of their mind was an increasing dynamic. Just because you sit in a church and listen to a sermon doesn't mean you're saved, doesn't mean you're open to accountability, doesn't mean you love the truth, doesn't mean you have a healthy relationship, and doesn't mean you're on the road to eternal life. What it does mean is that if the Spirit of God is moving through his word and the messenger, you have a chance to let him realign and bring the organization of your relationships into perfect alignment to where if the wheel had to be let go of for a minute, catastrophe is not around the corner. So this morning, let's open our Bibles up to the book of 1 Kings, and let's look at this just a little more carefully. Cultures go bad slowly, but when they do go bad, the evidences are all around. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we get the first evidence of how bad the culture had gone. Now, we're not that many kings removed from Solomon. You remember that Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Re Rehoboam split the kingdom, and now you've got two tribes in the south, Benjamin and Judah, and ten tribes in the north, and they will be under the direction of Jeroboam. Jeroboam will set up golden calves so that people won't make their three yearly pilgrimages down to the southern kingdom, and everything will get back together again. You don't go very many people from Jeroboam before you find yourself at Omri, and then after Omri comes Ahab, and here we are. So it's not many, many years from the divesting of the kingdom from one to two that we find ourselves in this story. And it's gotten so bad, uh, thanks to Solomon, who had his 700 wives and 300 concubines, and who was drawn, especially in his older years, to idol worship, that we ha now have a nation so bereft of right and wrong that Elijah thinks he's the only person. Three years of no rain have come and gone, and Elijah is, Elijah is told to show himself, verse 1 of chapter 18. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe. Ahab called Obadiah, who was a faithful man, and who was over the household. Don't forget, there are many faithful people still operating inside sometimes corrupted systems. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For when Jez Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Now, I don't have time to preach on this. You could preach a sermon on the courage of a little-known man by the name of Obadiah. If you think it was without risk of being found out that you actually fed a hundred people from the king's dole when he's got you out looking for a little bit of water and a little bit of grass for the, the herds of Jezreel, of Samaria, you think again. 
God is always calling us out of our comfort zone. He does it incrementally because he knows what we're ready for. But Obadiah is a great man of faith. Then, Ob then Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we'll find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself. Obadiah went another way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on the way, behold, voila, the man nobody could find is findable. Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, is this you? You might interject the word, really? Is this really you, Elijah, my master? And he said to him, it is I. And without much, he bids him adieu. Go say to your master, behold, Elijah's here. And that brought terror to the heart of Obadiah. He said, what sin have I committed that you're giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? The culture is so bad in Israel at this point in time. And the lack of uh, what I'll call the, the steadiness of emotion that's in a true man of God's heart is so bereft from Ahab. And the focus to find criminal number one, the wanted posters around all the post offices in Israel, had there been some, was such that Obadiah was so afraid that even to mention he had run into him without accosting him, without grabbing him and trying to tie him up and drag him back to Samaria was a criminal offense and Obadiah didn't know what to do. He shows honor to the prophet and he doesn't know what he's going to say to the king when he says, what do you mean you came back without him? I mean, it's, it's a terrible culture. I want to build out the culture just a little bit more. You remember after Ahab died and his son was on the throne? And of course you remember that Elijah called fire down from heaven. Well, the king had fallen through the lattice and he sent one of his courtiers to find out from the prophets of Baal if he was going to live or die. And Elijah cuts him off at the pass and he says, it's because there's no God in Israel that you're going to Baal and the gods of Ekron. And so the guy turns around and he goes back and he tells the king, and he says, what did he look like? Well, he had a lot of hair. He said, okay, that was Elijah. Well, you know, the king's not quite done with this whole thing. Elijah's not coming on his own, so he sends 50 men fighting men. And they come up to Elijah and sitting on a hill and they say, man of God, get down here. He says, if I'm a man of God, may fire consume you. <laughs> now listen, those 50 people were past the point of repentance. I, I have absolute confidence. They were so corrupted by the culture and their own choices. God doesn't kill people willy-nilly. If they died like that, it's because in the face of a man who did call fire from down from heaven, they don't even have enough sense to be a little bit more careful. A second group of 50 are sent. And they say the same thing. They can smell the burnt hair and the clothes and everything else that's laying on the ground by this mountain. And the guy does the same thing. The captain does the same. He says, get out here. Man of God, get out here. And he says, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume me. And it happens. And finally, there's a third group of 50 that come, and that captain is a little bit more astute to the dynamics of divine power, and he bows down and he pleads with Elijah. But I want you to see how broken the culture is that a man who can call fire down from heaven and does it once on a group of 50, the second group will do the same thing and meet with the second fate. And then I want to go to one more thing that shows how broken the culture was, and that's after Elijah went to heaven. There's this bald guy that takes his place, his name's called Elijah, Elisha. And all of those, those kids, I mean, kids are smart. They don't miss the signals. They know, they know what gives. They listen to the chatter at home. Think they're going to be converted while you run down the man of God? Think again. But God's not okay with it. And so after Elijah's gone to heaven, Elisha is walking through the streets of one of the city and he's being mocked, scorned, and derided by a bunch of youth who probably aren't just throwing words. They're probably throwing dirt and things like that. And he calls out bears to teach them a lesson. We're back to accountability again, I think. And the spirit of prophecy will tell us that Elisha would walk through many groups of irresolute and rebellious youth, but nobody would ever dare talk to him like that again. God's big into accountability. He understands alignment and lack thereof and the potential to cast away every gift he's ever wanted to give us. So he sends prophets. That's why the proverb says, 
for lack of vision, the people perish. It's not so that we can know the future. It's so that we can know right and wrong in the now. Without the prophetic voice, people are in big trouble. And so here we are in a very messed up culture, and Obadiah doesn't even want to go back and say, I saw him, but I didn't bring him, because he's afraid that he'll die. The encounter's not far off, though. Verse 10, as the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. And when they said he's not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they could not find you. And now you are saying to me, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. And it'll come when I leave you that the spirit of the Lord will carry you away. I don't know where. So when I come and tell Ahab and he can't find you, he's going to kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord in my youth. Hasn't it been told to you, my master, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? That I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Listen, Obadiah could have just kept his head low. He had no skin in the game. He could have kept his good government job and received his wonderful fat paycheck and enjoyed the best restaurants of Samaria. But I want to tell you something. Godly people, when they see something wrong, they start doing something. That's pretty weak. And I just want you to know something. Obadiah starts quietly finding a way to save people from the wrath of a wicked woman. And in the process, he's recorded in sacred history as an absolute hero of the faith. And he's reminding Elijah that he is in the game with him and he has taken some risk. Elijah said, verse 15, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely now show myself to him today. So as I, uh, oh, oh, Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Now here's the showdown. Two narratives. Here you go. It's simple. I don't want to make this complex. We've got two narratives, two rebukers. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, okay, here we go. Narrative number one, rebuke number one. Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now, I just want those words to settle in. Because when truth is not on your side, you resort to the destruction of the truth teller. It could not rain for three years and this king is so hard-headed and so hard-hearted. By the way, God will still try to save this guy. We don't have time to go into the chapters that follow this one. But, but there is divine deliverance provided through prophetic encouragement to the nation of Israel with this same dude. But I want you to see how off he is and how wrong his mentality is and what he has to resort to. And all we can really say is that there's the troublemaker. You're messing it all up. But Elijah is not going to bat an eye. He's going to come right back at him. And I want you to see the difference between narrative number one and narrative number two. He said, Elijah, Elijah says, I have not troubled Israel. But you and your father's house have troubled because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. Narrative number one is an attempt to diminish the witness of a man of God and deride his very person. Witness number two does no deriding of person but does lay blame at the feet of the guilty and it's not very pleasant. When you are unwilling to lift the window and quit looking through the opaque glass when you're unwilling to solve the narrative issues by simply saying, let's lay it all out on the table. When you don't have an investigation, you have to have intervention by God. And I want you to know something. When the wickedness of this world turns on the faithful people of God who have given a call to repentance, they have been the modern day Elijah movement. The same thing's going to happen. There will be no corporate investigation. There will be individuals who will align themselves with truth and join the remnant church. But where this party ends up is on the top of Mount Carmel. And on the top of Mount Carmel, you have some think 450, some think it's 850 because there's a delineation between the prophets of one of Baal and, and the, prophet, the other prophets of Jezebel. 
But whether it's 850 or 450, we do know this. There's only one person standing on God's side. And finally, after a day of ranting and raving and bloodletting, he calls the people close to him. And he says to him, look, if God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. And the saddest, one of the saddest lines in all the scripture is that everybody just stood there. They didn't say anything. And finally, after an altar is built back up and barrels of water are poured on it three times, Elijah kneels down in front of that altar and he prays a very simple prayer. And he says, Lord, show them that you are God. Show them that I am your servant. And show them that I have done this at your command. And it's gone. And the people are on their faces, and Elijah is up saying, it's judgment time for the prophets that have led this nation astray. When there's not investigation, there has to be divine intervention, and woe to those who have hidden the truth and failed to pursue light. There's one other story which I will only take a brief time to share with you, and this is Farther down the road when Jehoshaphat and Ahab are going to go against the, against the king of Aram. And Jehoshaphat says, after listening to all of Ahab's worthless prophets, he says, isn't there a true prophet of God we could talk to? This time it's not even Elijah, it's Micaiah. And he says, yeah, but he never says anything good about me. <laughs> so they go get him. And the messenger who went to God him, get him said, look, everybody else has told the two kings, go for it. It's going to turn out good. Just agree with them. Just agree with them. And he said, okay. He gets there and he said, go for it. And the king Ahab says to him, how many times have I had to tell you? Tell me the truth. Don't, don't say what I want to hear. And he says, okay. I saw the whole nation scattered. This is how bad the culture is. Even though the prophet says, I mean, the false prophets are all there. Zedekiah, one of the false prophets, actually takes and makes a horn of iron. Now, you need to know in the Bible, a horn is a symbol of power. And he says, you're going to gore your enemies with this horn. And after Micaiah says what he says, Zedekiah walks over to, to Micaiah and he slaps him in the face and he said, how did the Spirit of God pass from me to you? I mean, the Bible is way too visceral. We don't have a sanitized version of the human battle between right and wrong in the Holy Scripture. I mean, we've got it up close and personal. You got one pastor slapping the other pastor in the face saying, where do you think you come off with your story? And Micaiah has to tell Ahab, you're going to die if you go out to fight this battle. And he has to tell Zedekiah, <laughs> because the king says, throw that prophet in jail and give him just enough to keep him alive until I come back. And Micaiah says, if you come back, I'm a false prophet. And he says to Zedekiah, he tells them the gig's up on him too. It would be nice if we could practice the postmodern version of Everybody go along to get along and truth doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is we're headed towards a society where, uh, as one of the professors at Andrews told me recently, they saw this big banner up on the side of a, build, uh, a building in Las Vegas said, we'll hire anybody that will show up to work. <laughs> I hear some of our employers laughing. I wish they didn't have to. The society around us is getting ready to implode and it's because we no longer believe in judgment and accountability and healthy relationships and following Matthew 18. When you have more than one narrative, there's only one way to find out. Give a body, a representative body, the facts. Let them look at it. That's why, you know, when I had to show up at the door of that woman that was committing adultery 25 years ago with my head elder, no, she didn't want us coming in her house. And I've told you before how bizarre, you know, when, you're, when your thinking gets darkened by sin, it gets really bizarre. And I've mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again because the audience changes at times. And she said, 
to this young 30-some-year-old pastor and this young 30-some-year-old held elder. You don't think two sets of parents are better for kids than one? I've never walked off a porch more bewildered in my whole life, but I had a living, visible <laughs> representation of how dark your thinking gets when you walk in sin. Narratives. Investigation or intervention? Dr. Paul Brand, famous orthopedic surgeon who was a minister to the leper colonies of, of India, tells the two stories. One of Tanya, the little year and a half, two-year-old girl. She had a serious problem. Her problem was, was that she felt no pain. What that meant was, was that if she, and she figured this out, the horror, to the horror of her parents, they came in one day and they could see red smeared all around the wall by her crib. What they discovered was that it was her own blood. And little Tanya was a wise little girl. Dr. Brand ran into her because she had a wound so bad on her foot that the bone was visible. The problem that Tanya had was that because she felt no pain, there was no real accountability system for her, and one of the ways she controlled her parents was threatening to bite off the ends of her fingers. Now, this is pretty bizarre. By the time she was 11 years old, because there was no way to control her, she had had both legs amputated, and she was in a... She was in an asylum. You know, leprosy is actually a disease that is not that easy to spread. Its real name is Hansen's disease. I, I want to tell you, once when Dr. Brandt was gone, three or four days away from home, I want to tell you how truth works so you don't get the wrong idea. He was gone three or four days from home. What he didn't know was that there was a man who had heard that he was treating leprosy. The man saved up all of his money. In India, there's lots of stigma, and there's a caste system, and societal structuring is a big deal, and being actually an untouchable is a reality. And he saved all his money up. He got as close to Valor, where the clinic was, as he could get, and then finally, with his last little bit of money, he was going to ride the bus out to the clinic, but the bus driver wouldn't let him on the bus because he was a leper. So he took his last bit of money, and he paid it to a rickshaw driver who actually drove him out to the clinic. To his great crestfallen and heartbrokenness, Dr. Brand's wife had to tell him that the doctor was gone and would be gone for three or four days. What Mrs. Brand did not know was that he had spent his last rupee getting to the clinic for some hope. He made no consternatious objection to the fact that the doctor wasn't there. He simply turned to walk away. Now, this woman has to make a decision. She doesn't know he has no money, but she understood the plight of lepers in India, and she said to him, do you have anywhere to go? <laughs> He stopped and he turned around and he probably hung his head and he said, no. So she invited him, full-scale leprous patient, to come sleep in their house on the veranda. And when Dr. Brand got home, the kids were talking about how nice their guest was. And when he found out he was a leper, he had a hard time appreciating the fact that his wife had let that man stay in their house. But his wife looked at him because while she didn't know how much money he had, which turned out to be zero, she did know that Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick and you ministered to me. One day when Brant started his clinic, after great protests, by the way, that nobody else would come to the clinic if they treated lep lepers, when they announced it to the crowd that was waiting in the clinic, one man who no longer had a foot, well, he didn't have a full foot, started hobbling towards the doctor so he could get in line. And when he saw everybody else coming, he threw his clutch away, crutch away and he started running. By the time he got there, the tibia was exposed 
and there was bone that was easily seen and there were sticks and rocks up in the bone marrow. But don't mind you, he couldn't feel any pain. I'm telling you, as the book is entitled, pain is a gift nobody wants. But when there's a judgment coming, God knows sometimes there has to be a bit of pain. Lest we should throw away in the moment through lack of accountability and feedback that which eternally can't be recovered once you pass a certain point. How many kids in Israel died of starvation? How many beasts of burden lay down in the dust and the heat to breathe their last? How many men watched their, their wives and wives watched their men? Because for three plus years it didn't rain. I leave you with this. Saul was co committed to God to the concept of accountability, that Jesus became a human being. And in his humanity, linked with his divinity, he went on a journey which at times held people completely accountable. Judas rejected accountability. He had his own narrative. Pilate had wounded pride. So did Judas, both of them at the very, in the very last hours, and Peter, by the way, three men with wounded pride in the last hours of Jesus' life. The first one takes his life quickly. The second one looks into the face of Jesus after he told him, oh, no, you don't know me, I'll never deny you. But when Jesus looks at him through the, the hallways of Caiaphas' courtyard, he's heartbroken, he, he goes back out and can't believe he did what he just did, but his wounded pride set him up for that moment. And, and finally, Pilate, when Jesus refuses to answer him, wounded pride. Jesus so believes in accountability that the masses will leave him in his ministry. And by the way, if you're an ordinary human being and not much of a Christian, when the masses go, you have to say to yourself, who am I? But that's not what Jesus did. And he turned to his other 12 followers and he said, are you going to leave too? That's how bad it got. Jesus goes all the way to the cross. He tells them, you're going to deny me. He's going to betray me. All of you are going to run away from me. They all did. And finally, Jesus is abandoned by the official church the one he's developing in the form of the apostles, and he is left all by himself. And he is lashed two times, 40 minus one. And finally, he's stripped naked, can't carry his cross. He's flayed out in the hot sun and the gazing masses mocking and deriding him. And he, God so much understands what, what coming judgment without a mediator means that he's willing to go through it go through it. And he experiences the second death, which is why the seventh day of his church is on the face of the globe to begin with, because the final announcement of mercy is coming someday soon. That's why we must be the people of truth whose minds are not darkened by loving darkness, but we hold each other to a high standard of accountability because we know truth sets us free. And we're to do justly, love mercy and walk humbly. Friends, we're just back to the beginning. And this is how it's going to be to the end. It's just now we philosophically support the concept, not us, but the world supports the concept that that's just your perspective. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Even the secular world knows when push comes to shove, you're going to get a group of people together. They're going to get to see the evidence and there's going to be a rendering because there is this second law of thermodynamics that everything moves from a state of order to disorder. It's true spiritually too. And the longer you've incubated in the system, the more pride and the more temptation there is to deviate from the spirit and principle and precepts of truth. This morning, friends, I'm appealing to you. Be the Obadiah. 
I'm appealing to you, be the Elijah when you're supposed to be it, whether it's with kids or a spouse or a preacher or a teacher or an employer or whatever it might be. Be the people we're called to be and understand if they don't repent, their hatred will increase, their, their, their animosity will grow, and it's either going to come to an investigation or an intervention. We don't know which it will be. But I can assure you this, God sits on his throne watching what's going on and sometimes he lets us suffer and he always is by our side giving us strength but I can assure you this you reap what you sow and there is a day of reckoning that's coming where all things will be shouted from the rooftops and all the chapters will be open and we won't be looking through a glass darkly our privilege in the now is to walk in the steps of Jesus prophet walking in the garden prophet providing skins, priest, and king, sitting enthroned above the circle of the earth, waiting for the time when he can make all things new. In the meantime, friends, you need to understand this is the Elijah movement, and we are committed to a discovery of truth, because truth still sets people free. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. need to trim your lamps folks to let the light shine let's remember that as we sing